So why don't we start? So hello, everyone. I'm Mike Douglas, and this is the New Technologies in Mathematics seminar of the CMSA at uh, Harvard University. And today we're delighted to have Dmitry Krotov from uh, IBM Research, in fact, the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, who will tell us about uh, the modern Hopfield network. Uh, the Hopfield network, of course, was one of the works that uh, started uh, the you know, neural networks and interaction with uh, physics. So very, you know, you know, back in the 80s, you know, very, very important work, but uh, it's had many insights to give over the years and it's being renewed to give us even more insights. So uh, as I always do, I'll offer to uh, watch the chat. And if you have a uh, question that uh, you're not sure if, you know, you, you, perhaps it's worth asking, perhaps there's a simple answer, uh, I'll take a look and uh, perhaps answer it myself if I can, or uh, send it to the speaker or encourage you to uh, to speak up. And of course, there'll be uh, time at the end and uh, you can break in with uh, questions as well. So with that, uh, Dimitri, please. Uh, well, Michael, thanks so much for, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I realize that the audience here is very diverse, and uh, for this reason, I'm going to start with, uh, with the basics, how people used to think about Hopfield networks in the 80s and 90s, and then I'm going to move more towards more recent uh, developments and applications and their relationship to modern foundation models. And uh, kind of, you know, connecting to what Michael just said regarding the questions, you know, frankly, I don't mind if you just ask questions throughout the talk. I think it's so much more fun if we have a conversation rather than just me talking for one hour. So just, you know, if you have a question, please uh, jump in, unmute yourself and uh, ask it right away. I think it's much more fun that way. So uh, let me uh, start with the definition. Uh, so what is a Hopfield network of associative memory? For those of you who don't know, and probably many people on this call know this much more, uh, better than I. But essentially, uh, uh, the Hopfield network is the following idea. It's a recurrent neural network, which is described by the state vector that evolves in time according to some sophisticated nonlinear dynamical equation. The equation can be binary, the equation can be continuous. This is, these are details. Uh, but what is unusual about Hopfield networks as opposed to uh, you know, other RNNs like LSTM or more vanilla uh, uh, traditional uh, recurrent neural networks is that Hopfield networks have the notion of the energy function. And the energy function is uh, this scalar quantity that uh, is uh, kind of you know, controlling the behavior of the state vector. And the idea is whatever the state vector is doing, uh, the energy function is only allowed to go down. So in a way, you can think about the state of this uh, recurrent Hopfield network as this red ball that is located somewhere on this sophisticated energy landscape. And uh, you know, I tried to make a cartoon of this energy landscape in two dimensions, but of course it's a multi-dimensional figure. And uh, when we allow this neural network to do the computation, these red balls rolls down the hill along the energy landscape until it reaches one of the local minimum. And uh, once it does so, we say that uh, the dynamical trajectory reached the fixed point in the final state of the state vector is retrieved from uh, the Hopfield network. And the terminology here is the following, that the local minima of the energy landscape or the fixed points are called memory vectors. So here they are denoted by these letters Xi1, Xi2, Xi3, and Xi4, and each of those Xi's is a high dimensional vector. So let's say it's a vector that lives in a high hundred dimensional space or something like that. And uh, the reason why uh, these vectors are called memories because you can think about this whole dynamical relaxation of the state into the uh, one of the local minima is the process of memorization, is the process of memory recall. So in some sense, you can think about the initial state as a little hint that you give to the uh, Hopfield network. In the final state, uh, you can think about it as the whole memory that is retrieved from the synaptic weights of uh, this RNN. And by the way, the reason why this idea is called associative memory is because uh, you can think about the uh, um, initial state and the final state of these dynamical trajectories as being associated with each other uh, through this uh, you know, continuous relaxation uh, trajectory. So that's a general idea. 
And uh, below, I'm going to illustrate a couple of conventional uh, use cases. And uh, there's nothing terribly new here. People used to use these use cases back in the 80s and 90s. And these common use cases are the completion of the incomplete patterns, like it is shown on the left, and the denoising setting, uh, like it is shown on the right. So let me explain what I mean by that. Imagine uh, someone has given me a bunch of high resolution images and I have encoded them as memories in this uh, Hopfield network. And then at the initial moment of time, I can give to the network uh, a hint, a prompt, if you wish, uh, that uh, you know represents part of that image. And you can see that it's a beak of some broad. But then if you uh, let uh, the dynamics evolve in time, you can see that associative memory recalls the entire image of the broad. And that's a typical example of the pattern completion task. A slightly different but related task is denoising setting. In the denoising setting, I start with an image uh, which is a corrupted image, extremely noisy version of uh, one of the memories. And it is so noisy that you by and large can't even tell what is plotted in that image. Yet, if I give it to the uh, Hopfield network of associative memory, you can see that uh, the nonlinear dynamics manages to remove the noise and uh, reconstruct a nice image of the bot. And of course, when we uh, say it in this uh, in a way, you immediately uh, hopefully start seeing parallels between uh, these two settings and uh, some of the modern trends in modern machine learning. So the uh, task on the left looks a little bit like masked autoencoder. Uh, so like when we uh, train large language models, this is literally what we do. We uh, uh, dedicate, uh, you know, a token to every word, and then we occlude some of those tokens, and we try uh, uh, to design the network that uh, predicts what uh, those occluded tokens are. So that's uh, like masked autoencoding task. And the task on the right uh, immediately reminds us about the diffusion models, because this is literally what we do in the, uh, you know, uh, like stable diffusion and all these like fancy models. Uh, that uh, can generate nice looking images. So already at this level, you uh, perhaps start seeing some connections between these uh, ancient ideas about Hopfield networks and some of the hot topics in today's machine learning. And uh, at least in the context of masked autoencoding, this is not just a high level analogy as you'll see throughout my talk, it is actually a precise mathematical statement that can be made about transformers and their relationships to uh, Hopfield networks. In the context of diffusion models, it's a little bit more open-ended and uh, it's kind of a, an open research question to what extent there are uh, parallels between these two ideas. But I think it's also a very exciting topic to uh, think about. Now, this idea has been famously formalized uh, by John Hopfield in the 80s. And uh, what he proposed is the following mathematical formalization of this notion. So essentially, you can think about the associative memory as this uh, energy function, or Hamiltonian, if you wish, that depends on uh, binary spins or neurons that are denoted by the letter sigma i. So essentially, what you can see here is a network of uh, capital N neurons, and each neuron is represented by a binary variable that can take two values, minus one or plus one. If uh, the variable is in the state minus one, you can think about that state as the neuron being in the off state. And if uh, the variable is equal to plus one, you can think about the neuron as uh, if it was firing an action potential. So it's kind of you know an abstract mathematical model of uh, uh, a neural network, but as you will see, it has the basic properties and functionalities that I have introduced on the previous slide. So essentially uh, what Hopfield and many others realized is that you can take the memories, the memory size, which are pretty much the same uh, uh, kind of vectors that I, as I introduced on the previous slide, and uh, you can construct this uh, symmetric matrix Tij by taking the outer products of those size. So index mu here enumerate memories, and index i and j enumerates the uh, embedding index into uh, some high dimensional space. So essentially, mu equals one corresponds to the broad, mu equals two corresponds to the uh, bold, et cetera, et cetera, right? And indices i and j are internal representations of those uh, memories. So it turns out that if you take this matrix, plug it into the expression for the energy function, then essentially this network works as a very nice model of associative memory in the sense, as I have described on the previous slide, but only if the number of memories uh, the number k of these vectors uh, xi that you embed into this network is sufficiently small. Uh, 
So if it is sufficiently small, then you can uh, encode each of those memories as a distinct basin of attraction in this energy landscape. But if K gets bigger, at some point you get into trouble because you can still put as many memories as you want into the network, but sometimes you would not be able to retrieve those memories from the network. So essentially, like those size will stop corresponding to the local minima of the energy function. And the reason why this uh, can happen is because uh, different memories can interfere with each other. And if you put two uh, memories that are sufficiently close to each other, instead of having two distinct local minima associated with each of those memories, sometimes you have a single local minimum in between. And that's bad. Like in statistical physics, uh, this notion of this, uh, you know, bad local minima is associated with spin glass states often. And that's exactly like the uh, transition that is happening here. And essentially, uh, what Hopfield and many others realized is that uh, in the uh, conventional Hopfield network, it happens at a very small number uh, of memories. So essentially, uh, the number of memories that you can store and retrieve from this network scales linearly with the number of neurons in this network. And if you try to embed this idea into some modern machine learning applications, you will immediately see that there is a problem here, that it's really uh, you would like the network to operate in the regime when the uh, number of neurons, number of feature neurons is fixed and uh, relatively small. And at the same time, the number of memories that you want to work with uh, needs to be very, very big. And uh, in the conventional Hopfield network, it is impossible to achieve because essentially like these two notions are very strongly coupled to each other. And a few years ago, we started thinking about how to resolve this problem and how to design a slightly uh, modified version of this idea that would not have this annoying problem. And that's how the idea of uh, dense associative memories or sometimes people also call them the modern Hopfield networks these days appeared. So essentially, the idea of the uh, uh, modern Hopfield networks is that one would like to construct an energy function that is more nonlinear in sigmas. So it's no longer be a quadratic function, but it's going to be a, an energy function which has some higher order terms in it. So specifically, uh, let's go back for a second to the uh, conventional classical Hopfield network and try to rewrite it slightly. So if I take this TIJ, plug it in here, and slightly rearrange the sums over indices i, uh, j, and mu, you can see that I can uh, write this energy function in the following form. So I take the vector sigma, I take the dot product of that sigma with each of the memories, and then I square uh, that overlap. And that's essentially, um, let me just pull it from everything. And that's essentially the energy function. And, uh, and, that, and, and that's kind of, you know, formulation creates uh, this problem that I have just described. So in contrast, in the dense associative memory network, what one needs to do is instead of squaring that overlap, we're going to pass it through a very rapidly growing function f. And uh, the trick here is that function needs to be like really uh, increasing very, very rapidly. It needs to be like an exponential function or like rapidly growing power function or something like that. And if uh, one picks that function in a smart way, it is possible to achieve a super linear memory storage capacity. So, so essentially, uh, now we can turn the linear scaling relationship between the maximal number of local minima or retrievable memories in this network and the number of neurons, we can uh, turn it into a super linear scaling one. And uh, the computation here is very similar to the uh, uh, one that was done by Hopfield or uh, in the famous paper by uh, Amit Gutfried and Sampolinsky uh, in the 80s. So essentially, uh, you consider an ensemble of random memories xi. Uh, let's say that each uh, xi mu i comes from a uh, uh, you know distribution where plus one or minus one can appear with equal probability a half, and then you average across that ensemble. And you can show that statistically, uh, what happens is that uh, if, for example, this function f of x is picked as a power law, like x to the power n, you can show that the maximal number of memories that one can store and retrieve from this network scales like size of the network raised to the power n minus 1. So essentially, uh, you can see that if this function is quadratic, then we recover the conventional Hopfield network, and then we recover the linear scaling relationship. 
But if uh, this power n is bigger than two, then uh, the memory storage capacity grows way faster than linearly. So for example, for n equals three, it grows quadratically. And that's essentially the essence of the mathematical phenomenon that I'm going to use for building all the AI systems that I will uh, describe later on uh, in this presentation. So uh, if you're interested in uh, like this core mathematical idea and uh, kind of, you know, how it can be derived, etc., you can take a look at uh, these two papers that are uh, mentioned at the bottom of this slide. And also, I should probably uh, append this list because a couple of about a week ago, there was another paper uh, which came out from Mark Mizar group uh, who uh, did like some rigorous computation with replicas. And I, I still need to read the paper uh, carefully, but but it seems like they confirmed these results and they uh, kind of, you know, established a more detailed phase diagram uh, of these networks. So like, uh, by all means, uh, please take a look. I think it's an archive. Uh, Right. So that's essentially uh, the main uh, sort of progress uh, that relates conventional Hopfield networks and dense associative memories uh, that, you know, happened recently. And I also want to, uh, just to wrap up this slide, I want to explain why we call this idea dense associative memory to begin with. Essentially, uh, the reason why I think the word dense is very appropriate here, because uh, uh, the network on the right operates pretty much in the same amount of configuration space. If we think about the uh, binary networks, the total amount of space that you have is two to the power n, right? Uh, but in the dense associative memory case, the memories are packed in a much denser way in that configuration space compared to the uh, classical quadratic Hopfield network. Yeah, so that's kind of, you know, the basic intuition. Okay, so, uh, of course, when we start doing machine learning, we don't really like working with binary variables because, um, oh yeah, uh, yeah, uh, thanks Hamza. Yeah, I guess like Hamza just posted like a, a link to uh, the paper by Mizart in the, ch in the chat. Uh, so, of course, when we do machine learning, we like uh, things to be fully differentiable. We like everything to be continuous. And uh, with binary variables, it is hard to do. So it turns out that uh, a very related class of models uh, can be formulated with continuous variables as well. So uh, like in binary variables, we flip those spins sigma i uh, at each iteration. With continuous variables, we uh, write differential equations. And you can see an example of these differential equations uh, in the slide. So essentially, uh, on the left, you can see something like dVi dt, which is vi is the state of the neuron, and h mu is the state of another neuron. And on the right, you can see some nonlinear dynamics. So the nonlinearity here comes uh, in these activation functions, f mu and gi, which are heavily nonlinear activation functions. And I don't want to spend uh, too much uh, time explaining how these uh, continuous Hopfield networks can be derived, but I just want to briefly uh, make the statement that as soon as it comes to the question of memory storage capacity, by and large, whatever conclusions one can arrive at in the binary world, uh, the same conclusions can be applied uh, to the continuous uh, variables as well. And in fact, like Mizart paper, I think it treats continuous variables uh, like in a very nice and comprehensive way. Although again, I have to read it more carefully. So, uh, uh, and uh, kind of, you know, the conclusion here is that, uh, you know, if we want to do deep learning, we of course want to do continuous variables. And uh, with continuous variables as well, you can pick up nonlinearities in the right-hand side of these equations like functions f mu and gi, in a way so that the memory storage capacity of these new Hopfield networks is uh, dramatically enhanced compared to their uh, sort of more conventional counterparts from, uh, from the 80s and 90s. So if you kind of, you know, want to read more about uh, the continuous Hopfield networks, please check out one of these uh, papers that is uh, mentioned uh, here on the right. And uh, now I'm moving on more to transformers. So a few years, around 2020, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, people noticed that if one takes dense associative memory model, and instead of uh, picking the activation function, this uh, function f of x in the form of the power function or an exponential function, uh, one can pick that function as an integral of the softmax. 
So imagine that like you literally take this formula and plug it into this formula instead of f of x, the integral of the softmax activation function. For those of you who are uh, don't who are like more uh, uh, coming from the physics background, softmax is just a Boltzmann distribution. And you can take that Boltzmann distribution and you can integrate it and you get something like log of the sum of the exponents. And uh, so if you pick f in that form, then essentially dense associative memory, uh, this model identically reduces to the attention mechanism in transformers. Uh, just to be clear, Dimitri, uh, the, the softmax is a function of uh, many arguments, and then you, you have a sum in the denominator. Are the many arguments, in your case, to different memories or uh, something else? Correct, correct, exactly. So uh, the many, uh, indeed, like, uh, so softmax looks uh, something like this. It's e to the power h mu divided by sum of the e to the power h mu across a bunch of stuff, a bunch of like different possibilities, right? To normalize, to normalize uh, the overall. But, but here, the possibilities are the memories. Is, is the possibilities are the memories. Exactly, Good. exactly. Yeah. And and the distribution here uh, would be uh, kind of you know qualitatively. You can think about is how much attention uh, should I pick to a given memory. So someone shows me a prompt and uh, like, uh, let's say, let's go back here. So let's say that I, uh, you know, design this network and in the memory number one, I have the broad, in the memory number two, I have a bolt, in the memory number three, I have a dog. So now I show this big and then uh, like this model generates a probability distribution, right? Across all those memories. And essentially uh, that probability should be somehow more focused on the first local minimum. So it should by and large ignore the boat and the dog, and it should focus on the broad only. And that's exactly like what that thing is. So from the perspective of Hopfield network, it's just a choice of the activation function, right? So like, like, like this F needs to be chosen in a smart way. That's all. But, but then, of course, uh, the cool thing about this is that if you take the definition of the energy and you derive the equation for the evolution of the state vector, you suddenly see the softmax uh, which represents the attention mechanism. And that's what uh, people got people excited uh, because uh, because uh, attention, of course, is extremely important in modern machine learning. Pretty much like all lang large language models like chat GPT and stuff uh, are all based on this, you know, core uh, computational element, uh, which is, uh, by the way, mentioned here in the slide. Uh, and uh, and essentially, uh, what uh, Ramsauer and uh, 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 collaborators realized that if you pick uh, the activation function in a certain form, then dense associative memory reduces to transformers. And the reason why this is cool is because suddenly uh, you get a theoretical framework for thinking about transformers. Right? You can, for example, take pre-trained systems like Broad or I don't know ChatGPT or whatever, and you can ask what are the memories in those systems. Is there an energy function? Are there any basins of attraction, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, just, be, just to be clear. So in your dense, your soft max dense memory, the uh, sum and the denominators over the uh, memories. And in a, a transformer attention, the, uh, there's a series of uh, states, you know, one for each uh, embedding of each word. And then the sum is over the different words or the different embeddings in, in the uh, string of words. So it's uh, formally the same, but the interpretation is a little different. Yes, the interpretation, you can argue that it's different, but in fact, I think it's it's not. Uh, because I think about it like this. Let's say that every word uh, induces a certain latent representation, right, in, in language. And then uh, think about uh, that representation as a memory. So now uh, you, get, you get a new token, a new word that, is, that was initially occluded in the sentence, right? And that sentence, uh, that occluded word needs to query, uh, uh, you know, open words. And in some sense, it's indeed a question uh, that of, of the following flavor, that the information uh, about the open words is already presented. It's already like stored in the network as memories. And the word that is trying to decide whom it should become is going to ask all those, uh, you know, tokens, all those, you know, presented memories about whom it should become. So in some sense, it's it's uh, on the one hand you're right. It's just like a mathematical uh, sort of um, maybe you could say an anecdotal uh, correspondence between the model, right? Because indeed it's it's very formal. But at the same time, if you think a little bit about the attention mechanism, it's very tempting to think about it uh, uh, even at the high cognitive level from the perspective of memory retrieval, because indeed. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. 
yeah, indeed, like the uh, curates here uh, are the question marks, a little bit like prompts, and the keys here are a little bit like memories. Yeah. So there is uh, like both high level motivation for these correspondence and precise sort of, you know, formal mathematical uh, correspondence between yeah. these two ideas. So, I mean, I kind of, you know, I, I honestly think that it's it's an actually a very natural way to think about self-attention mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, yes, so essentially uh, transformer block that you can see here, and uh, presumably most people on this call have seen, uh, uh, you know, this kind of diagram before, so I don't have to explain this in detail, but essentially uh, like this, uh, you know, computational primitive is the core of all the like recent buzzwords that we read about in New York Times, like chat GPT, uh, foundation models, et cetera, et cetera. So the core element here is this multi-head attention operation. Uh, which is the following thing. So uh, essentially you uh, take the token that goes into this block, you construct three uh, representations from these tokens, uh, from this token, uh, the matrix of uh, curious keys and values, and you combine them in uh, this certain way. And, uh, and essentially the reason why it is related to dense associative memories, because you can think about keys here as memories. You can think about uh, curious here as states, and uh, you can think about the value matrix as, uh, in some sense, a transposed memory. And if you think about all these three representations in that way, then it becomes identical to the dense associative memory with the softmax activation function. And this uh, kind of, you know, opens up, uh, uh, you know, plenty of explorations about uh, interpreting uh, pre-trained models uh, through the lens of associative memories. And more importantly, it opens up the question, can we build better transformers? Like indeed, kind of, you know, even at the high uh, level, when we think about large language models, it is very tempting to think about them as kind of these gigantic associative memories. This is memory is a bunch of stuff. They have a little bit like a basin of attraction for every notion. They have a basin of attraction for talking about, say, financial markets. They have a basin of attraction to uh, talk about, I don't know, algebraic operations. And these are different basins of attractions. But once you provide a little bit of a prompt to the network, uh, like we do with ChatGPT, we suddenly place them in one of the basins of attraction. And the, once we do so, then uh, suddenly large language models, they become fluent and they can answer meaningful questions about that specific topic. So even at the high level, it's very tempting to think about large language models this way. And it turns out that there is even more uh, precise mathematical correspondence between one building element uh, of the large language models, the self-attention operation and uh, associative memories. So uh, what we've been trying to do is to uh, take uh, this sort of second motivation, the idea that uh, dense associative memories can be the guiding principle for building better transformers. And we uh, wanted to try to sort of materialize it a little bit and try to build uh, some kind of you know, powerful AI systems that are fundamentally built around this idea. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So, uh, so let me introduce you this architecture that we called energy transformer. So uh, indeed, again, it's a variant of the Hopfield network. So it's a recurrent neural network that has a global energy function. And that operates on a set of tokens. And for concreteness, I'm going to talk about images. Uh, but as you'll see, the architecture is pretty much agnostic about the data domain. It can be applied to language. It can be applied to graphs, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't really matter. So for images, imagine that uh, someone gave me an image. Uh, let's say it's a nice panda. And I took that image and I split into non-overlapping patches, like it is shown here uh, uh, on the left portion of the slide. So essentially, I have four patches. And each patch becomes a token. Uh, so at the moment of time t equals to 0, I occlude some of those tokens. So you can see that these two tokens are revealed, and these two tokens are occluded. And then I'm going to add uh, some positional embeddings that will tell me that uh, you know where each of those tokens are located in the image plane. And I'm going to treat the sum of the positional embeddings plus the initial state as a token. And I'm going to pass it to uh, this special uh, energy transformer block. And I'm going to apply that block recurrently. So again, throughout this computation, the energy is going to decrease. There is a well-defined energy, uh, which is a Lyapunov function for uh, these nonlinear dynamics. 
And the goal is to define, to design this energy in a way so that as the computation progresses, uh, eventually I will uh, get my energy transformer in paint uh, the missing uh, patches. So that's the idea. And of course, like the big difference between this framework and the nice images that I have shown to you on the previous slide, this ones, right? Is that in the first slide, these images were given to me in advance. So, I mean, I can only reconstruct that specific broad and that specific bolt. But if I take like the image of what I see from my window, uh, I would also generate either a bolt or the broad. But like uh, the, for the energy transformer, we want to be able to reconstruct and embed any meaningful image, not necessarily those images that we used in training those networks, right? So it's a much more sophisticated system, but as you will see, it actually works uh, quite nicely as well. Right, so that's the idea. So now how do we do this? So the idea is that we need to modify this core uh, uh, computational block of the transformer. So again, on the left, you can see the familiar, the standard transformer block with the uh, multi-head uh, attention operation and the feed-forward network and uh, addition and normalization steps. And on the right, you can see the energy transformer block. And uh, you will see that there are some meaningful differences between the two. So uh, let me kind of you know, go through those differences one by one. And kind of, again, the computational rationale for uh, designing that energy transformer block is that it needs to satisfy the condition of the gradient descent. Because, of course, as physicists, we know very well that if we write some nonlinear differential equation, something like dx dt equals something, that something is, in most cases, cannot be represented as a gradient of the scalar function. And you actually need to, uh, you know, cook the right-hand side uh, in a very special way to be able to claim that it is a gradient of the uh, scalar energy function. So that's essentially what we're doing here. We're trying to build the energy function in a way so that this whole computation of the transformer block is uh, described by the uh, differential equation that describes the energy descent dynamics in the inference path, right? So like, I'm not talking about training here at all. Everything that I'm talking about is the forward path uh, in uh, conventional deep learning. Uh, right, so what are the differences? So uh, the first difference is that uh, the multi-head attention operation, which is a little bit analogous to this multi-head energy attention operation here, acts in parallel uh, with uh, the feed-forward network. For reasons that will become clear in a moment, we call the feed-forward network the Hopfield network. And in fact, like that Hopfield network is the vanilla Hopfield network from the 80s. So it's like a quadratic Hopfield network. But the dense associative memory is actually related to this block, to the multi-head energy attention. So that's the first difference, that these two modules, they are, they are plugged in parallel as opposed to uh, uh, consecutively uh, in this architecture. Uh, the second difference is that there are only two errors that go into the multi-head energy attention. And in the conventional uh, transformer block, there are three errors that corresponds to curious skis and values. It turns out that in order to be compliant with the energy descent, uh, it is not possible to have all those three things uh, uh, you know, completely separate from each other. You need to tighten the weights a little bit. And uh, it turns out that uh, this architecture on the right only has uh, keys and curious but the matrix of values is derived from uh, the matrix of keys and uh, queries. That's why you only have two uh, errors here. But apart from that, it's a very similar network. So there is something that reminds us about the attention operation. There is something that reminds us about the feed-forward network here. And there is a couple of layer normalization and addition steps that are, again, uh, designed in a way that they uh, are compliant with the energy descent dynamics. So it turns out that it is possible to do that. And uh, there is a little bit of interesting math that goes into how you can do it. But if you're interested, uh, you can uh, take a look at this preprint that is uh, mentioned at the bottom of this slide. So let me uh, show you these energy functions. So essentially for the energy attention, the energy function looks like this. It looks like a little bit a sophisticated formula, but in fact, it has a very intuitive uh, uh, kind of you know, structure. So it has the matrix, the tensor of queries. It has the tensor of keys. It has uh, some scaling coefficient, which corresponds to the inverse temperature that in statistical physics we like to call beta. 
And it also has some exponents, some, some logarithms that are, uh, you know, put in a certain way so that you get uh, a softmax after you're taking derivative uh, of this uh, energy function. So and now let me explain all these indices. So essentially, index alpha here is the internal uh, embedding dimension, uh, which is essentially like uh, describes how you represent the queries and keys and how you can uh, like let them communicate with each other. The indices uh, B and C here represent tokens. So if we are doing images, think about token as uh, each patch in the image. So like, for example, here, uh, we can take this image and we can split it into many, many patches. And essentially, each patch uh, will be some kind of, you know, RGB representation of a little, uh, you know, piece of the image. And uh, we can assign uh, a certain token to each patch. And those tokens will be in, in, uh, enumerated by this indices B and C. And uh, the last index H is the index of head in the attention. Uh, so like, you know, probably know what heads are in transformers. Uh, from the perspective of associative memories, heads simply correspond to distinct Hopfield networks. So essentially you build network number one, then you have another network and you plug them in parallel so that they, uh, you know, help each other. And the idea is that even if you just put them uh, in parallel and you simply sum up the energies, once you start training them, uh, one uh, Hopfield network will learn slightly different representations compared to the other one. So they, in a sense, will act synergistically and help each other to learn kind of, you know, a nice representation of the whole world of images or text or whatever. So that's the idea. But, but essentially, uh, hopefully you can see that if you take the derivative of this energy with respect to uh, curious, you get something like a softmax. And that's what you need for, uh, for the uh, connection with the self-attention. But of course, uh, uh, you know, that's not quite accurate because, because also the keys depend on the, on the tokens. So when you take the derivative, you not only need to differentiate with respect to Q, but you also need to differentiate with respect to K. And it turns out that if you do that, then you uh, will see that the attention mechanism is slightly modified. So it's not going to be just a conventional uh, attention mechanism, but there will be an extra piece. And that extra piece is the price that you need to pay, or maybe not the price, maybe it's a benefit uh, that you gain uh, by, uh, you know, uh, putting this overall arching uh, framework of energy-based descent. But kind of, you know, the thing that I want to emphasize here that the attention uh, operation here is going to look slightly different compared to the conventional one. It will have the conventional piece plus a slightly unconventional piece, but that unconventional piece also has a lot of meaning. And uh, for the uh, Hopfield network, it's going to be just a simple quadratic Hopfield network. Think about uh, this activation function R as a ReLU or a linear even function. So it's, it's a very simple network. And essentially, that's it. So if you put all those ingredients together, you can think about the energy attention block as a, a one-step update of the tokens that can be applied recurrently, and the whole sort of nonlinear multi-step dynamics is going to uh, do gradient descent on the energy landscape, right? So, hey, hey Dima, why do you use just a linear Hopfield network instead of like a dense one? Like. That's a good idea, a good, good question. I mean, technically it can be anything. It can be dense network here as well. But, but kind of, you know, uh, in some sense, what we are trying to do to accomplish here is the following idea. We want to feed in a bunch of images uh, into this network, right? And uh, in some sense, if you think about this, the attention operation, it memorizes, memorizes not a how specific patch of the image looking like, but rather than the rule, how those patches are put together in the image, right? So in some sense, like imagine you have like some, uh, a bunch of images and images have certain rules. Like uh, for example, if there is a left portion of the face, they got to be a right portion of the face and they need to be close to each other, right? So there are like these kinds of unwritten rules in the uh, universe of all possible natural images. And in some sense, we want dense associative memory to memorize those rules, not specific patches, but like those rules. And uh, at the same time, there are specific patches like textures and stuff. And, uh, and in some sense, it is this part, the classical Hopfield network, uh, maybe it's not classical, maybe you're right, it needs also needs to be like dense associative memory. But in some sense, uh, it's, um, 
it is like this other piece that uh, uh, stores information about about this sort of you know uh, low level statistics of the images, and uh, in some sense you kind of want a little bit more cooperation between the memory slots uh, in the second piece and a little bit fewer cooperation in between the memory slots in the first piece. That's why we sort of started with uh, using quadratic networks here. And interestingly, empirically, they also work a little bit better. But but uh, I don't think we kind of, you know, investigated that question in depth. So it might easily be that, you know, some form of modern hot field network could actually uh, be beneficial here as well. So yeah, don't like take my uh, a statement here too literally that it needs to be the classical hot field network. It might be dense associative memory as well. Gotcha. Thank you. Cool. So uh, let me show you how uh, this idea works on like real, uh, you know, natural looking images. And uh, here, essentially, what we have done is we uh, took like a relatively small data set uh, based on modern standards, ImageNet 1K, and we have trained uh, uh, this, uh, you know, energy transformer to do uh, imaging painting. And the way you should read these images is the following. So in the third row, you can see the ground truth images. So these are literally the images from the uh, from the data set. In the first, uh, uh, in the, sorry, in the third column, in the first column, you can see the initial states that we give to the energy transformer. And in the middle column, you will see uh, the intermediate states. And I'm going to play this movie and it will evolve in time. So please pay attention to the second column here. So essentially, initially, uh, those tokens, they are occluded, the gray tokens. Uh, but if I uh, let the energy dynamics uh, evolve and the energy, uh, the state of the network evolve in time, you can see that the tokens that were initially occluded, they are getting replaced with some meaningful representations of the image patches. And I want to emphasize that these images that you're looking at, uh, they're completely new images. So they have not been used in training of this network. So like they indeed like kind of, you know, come from the same distribution of images, uh, but they're not, uh, the network was not aware that I'm going to test it on uh, these specific images. And uh, hopefully you would agree with me that uh, the network indeed works uh, quite nicely. So indeed, uh, like you can see uh, that it does, you know, reconstructs tokens in a certain meaningful ways. Uh, the reconstructions are very far from perfect. So for example, I always like uh, this last example because it sort of you know speaks to the nature of computation of this network. So the ground truth image uh, is uh, the regular pattern of bricks, right? Which have very regular spacing. But because some of the boundaries in the initial prompt were completely occluded, you can see that for example, right here, the network reconstructs a very long brick as opposed to splitting it into uh, bricks of uh, proper length. And you could say that this is bad, right? The network somehow did not learn uh, the scale uh, of the length of the, the notion of the length of the brick. But at the same time, if you think about it, it's a pretty reasonable auto completion of that image because you, know, you could imagine a wall that looks a little bit like this one. And there are many, many examples uh, of uh, this kind of behavior uh, in all those images if you uh, take a look closer at them. Like another example that I like to give that uh, like in this one, uh, like the ground truth uh, is uh, a set of two peppers, two distinct peppers. And again, the gap between those two peppers was completely occluded, but the network somehow manages to reconstruct two distinct items here as opposed to one gigantic blob of green color. So there is some kind of, you know, notion of rules that indeed network has picked up from looking at a bunch of uh, natural images. So that's one application. Uh, we have also trained it, by the way, on the language task. And that's a whole subject of a separate conversation that I'm probably going to dedicate for a separate talk. But I do want to mention briefly anomaly detection task on graphs, uh, because uh, that's also part of that preprint that we put out uh, online. And uh, the nature of this task is the following. Uh, you can think about some you know, complicated graph uh, of, uh, say, financial transactions. So think about every node in the graph, say, as a bank account or a crypto wallet. And uh, like those uh, crypto wallets or bank accounts, they can transact with each other. And most of them are good players. They're not uh, engaging in any illegal activities, but some of them do. They can do money laundering, they can do fraud, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, how do you separate the good guys from the bad guys? 
And it turns out that the energy transformer is again like a perfect uh, architecture that is suited suitable for uh, detecting these bad anomalies. So essentially, you can start uh, with the state that is completely agnostic about uh, whether or not a given node is a good guy or a bad guy. Uh, the good guys are blue dots and the bad guys are red dots. But then as energy dynamics progresses, some of the nodes are thrown into blue ones and some of the nodes thrown into red ones. And that's again kind of you know very aligned with the core design of the computation of uh, this kind of network because the information about whether or not a given node is a good uh, a properly acting account or a bad account not only is encoded in the features of that node, but also in the neighborhood uh, with uh, uh, which other nodes does this node transact. And kind of, you know, uh, like this attention mechanism over all the nodes uh, can, uh, you know, route that information to the uh, node uh, that uh, is questioning, uh, that, we're, that we're trying to figure out uh, the anomaly status of. So that's the idea. And it turns out that on this task, uh, energy transformer indeed performs extremely competitively. Uh, so you can see like quite uh, challenging baselines here. And you can see that energy transformer works uh, better than uh, like most of the uh, modern baselines on this task. Uh, Dima, just again, to, to, be, to be clear, uh, you, you, you wrote the dynamics. Now, the idea is that there's, there's one layer and the, the dynamics runs to a fixed point or is it something right. else? Yes, 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 exactly. Okay, so, yeah. so, so yeah. essentially, think about every think about this uh, gigantic uh, graph of you know all the uh, you know say financial transactions in the world, right? So you can think about each node. You can assign a token to each node, and then uh, uh, you put it into the energy transformer paradigm. So essentially, every node becomes a memory in the Hopfield network and simultaneously a state. And every node curious all the other nodes whom uh, like a given node should become. So essentially, this is kind of, you know, this collective information that sort of bounces between the nodes within this network. Every node is asking its neighbors, like, given who you are, whom should I be? Whether or not I'm a bad guy or a good guy. And uh, like this question is constantly being answered by every individual node. And after you let those nodes to co-evolve uh, for some time, they, uh, you know, they acquire some state, whether or not it's an uh, anomalous node or a regular node. And then we, th that's when we read out the information. So that's the kind okay. of and, 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 and coming back to the, to the image case, do you represent the two-dimensionality in some way, either by restricting connections or by positional embeddings or in some way? Oh, right, right, right. Um, so... And a great question. In fact, I'm like skipping so many technical details uh, that you're like carefully, uh, uh, you know, pointing those gaps now. So, so yes, we do. In the image domain, indeed, uh, as you correctly see, this attention operation is completely agnostic to permutations, right? So you can take all the tokens, you can completely permute them, and you know the network wouldn't even know. But uh, what we do is, and that's how people typically treat this task in the context of fission transformers, every token is supplemented with the positional embedding. So like uh, to every initial state, we uh, simply additively add a special vector which indicates where in the image plane that token is located. But, but then there is another a subtle difference that in the image plane, we have only a few image patches. So we can afford computationally to do all to all attention. So we can allow each individual patch to look at all the other patches in the same image plane. With the large graphs, we cannot, right? Because the graphs can be gigantic. Think about Facebook, for example, right? It's a gigantic social network. There is no way that we can do like a uh, computer Boltzmann distribution over all the users on Facebook. So what we do then, we restrict that Boltzmann distribution to be uh, restricted to the neighborhood on the graph. So it's it's a little bit of a hack, but but at the same time, it turns out that the nodes that are close to the target node, they're most informative about the anomaly status of the target. Okay. Node. And it turns out that it works quite nicely. All right, thanks. Cool. Okay, so uh, let me move on. So let me see how much time I have. I have about uh, five minutes left, right? Right. Yeah. So then let me uh, move towards conclusions, but I want to mention briefly one more piece of work that I like a lot. And um, I want to explain why we have done it and uh, what it is about. So that's the idea of hammocks, uh, which stands for hierarchical associative memory user experience. So 
it's a uh, it's a software engineering framework. And uh, the reason why we uh, put a lot of efforts in designing this network, and by the way, when I say we, I mean mostly Ben Hoover who uh, who developed this idea. Uh, and the idea is the following: uh, you know, when we used to do uh, deep learning, like back in the days, uh, say ten years ago. What we did uh, to train deep neural networks is the following. We first rolled down a forward path for the, uh, say, convolutional neural network or a multilayer perceptron. Then we define a loss function. And then we take that loss function and we manually, on a piece of paper, calculate derivatives of the loss function with respect to the weights. And then we take those analytical formulas, we plug them into MATLAB, and we you know, you know, know, train it on some task like MNIST classification. right? Of course, today nobody does that. Every uh, you know modern framework has autograph capabilities. Now, the cool thing about our networks, unlike uh, many other uh, you know mainstream networks in uh, deep learning, is that our network is actually a gradient descent on a well-defined energy function. So it is very tempting to design uh, an autograph uh, capability framework that would not only uh, use autograph in the reverse in the learning phase but would also use autograd in the forward path, right? Because the forward path itself is an energy descent dynamics on a new uh, loss, fun not, not loss function, a new energy function. And that's essentially what Hamux does. Uh, now, there is a little bit of a twist uh, to that, uh, which again, I didn't have time to explain today at all, but it turns out that even the energy is not the most fundamental concept for these kinds of networks. And the most fundamental concept is the notion of the Lagrangians. So essentially, you can, uh, when you design these networks, you can design a fairly complicated computational graph. So essentially, like you can see an example of uh, a computational graph here. And each of those blocks, like L0, uh, L1, L2, L3, correspond to neural layers. And uh, like those neural layers, they can be connected with each other in a very, very sophisticated way. But it turns out that if you define uh, each neural layer in terms of its corresponding Lagrangian function, then it is very easy and mathematically elegant to be able to derive the global energy function for the whole network and the individual update equations for each individual neuron. Uh, you need to believe to me uh, on that because I did not have time to explain this today. But Essentially, what Hamux does, you specify the computational graph, you specify the Lagrangian for each layer, and then you press a button, and uh, Hamux automatically, through Autograd, derives the forward path for you. And then you press another button, and the same Hamux derives uh, for you the reverse path that you need for training this neural network, again, through Autograd. So in some sense, you can completely like abstract yourself uh, from like taking derivatives manually, uh, both in the forward path and in the reverse path, and you can just completely dedicate it to autograph. And it sounds like it's a minor thing, but in fact, like uh, the developments that I've been talking about today, like with energy transformers, would not have been possible without that framework. So we did indeed uh, find it extremely helpful from the uh, technical perspective. So if you are at all in the software engineering uh, aspects of deep learning, please take a look at this uh, documentation and GitHub repository that is cited at the bottom of this slide. And ask me or Ben Hoover, uh, he really like enjoys uh, playing with this uh, kind of, you know, uh, software engineering abstractions. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and let me conclude. Uh, so essentially, uh, the long standing problems of memory storage capacity in Hopfield networks are gone by now. So uh, right now, if we want to tackle, you know, a quite diverse set of data science problems with Hopfield networks, at least you would not be able, uh, you would not be limited by uh, their lack of the memory storage capacity. You might be limited by something else, but at least like memory storage capacity is not an issue. You can uh, pick pretty much uh, a suitable Hopfield network for any data science uh, problem of interest. Uh, they can be both continuous and binary. Uh, people indeed like uh, like to talk about binary Hopfield networks because they are elegant and they are easy uh, to deal with mathematically, but they can be continuous as well. Uh, and it's a little bit more tricky to define the notion of memories, the notion of convergence in the context of uh, continuous variables, but it is possible to do. And all the theory uh, for the binary variables can be uh, translated, can be sort of translated into the continuous language as well. Uh, they can be hierarchical. 
they don't have to be uh, composed of one or several layers. They can you can have as many Hopfield layers as you want, and you can write a global energy function for them. Some of those layers can be convolutional. They can have cooling structure. Then can have uh, self attention. This is all again can be uh, nicely incorporated into the general notion of energy descent dynamics. And uh, lastly, and perhaps like more uh, sort of ambitiously, I genuinely believe that uh, Hopfield networks can be a guiding principle for designing novel energy-based energy descent architectures for novel machine learning uh, systems. And that's essentially what we're doing. And uh, if some of you guys are interested and excited about these topics, we would be delighted to collaborate and discuss. So please let me know. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm out of time. Probably I am, but so I'll stop uh, here. No, it was, it was good. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Uh, Andreas Hertz. Uh, Hi. Andreas? Uh, yeah. question is as follows. Um, a big advantage of the classical Hopfield network was that if we wanted to store patterns, this was done local in the neurons and local in the patterns. We would mm -hmm. just sum up. So how much of that is left over or is this a price to be paid to get this enormous storage capacity? Uh, thank you very much for this question, Andreas. Uh, great question. And uh, I should say, I should like tell you a little bit of a story. Because when we initially uh, uh, like introduced these ideas in 2016, we actually got a lot of criticism from the neuroscience community, uh, literally about that question. Because uh, people said, you know, yes, it does indeed uh, look like uh, like this modification of Hopfield networks. It might be useful from uh, some computational uh, perspective that you can store more memories, but it's complete nonsense from the neuroscience perspective, right? Because uh, when we think about conventional Hopfield networks, we can think about the TIJ here as a strength of the synapse between neuron I and neuron J. And uh, if we, for example, consider a cubic activation function here, then suddenly if we sort of take the sum over this index mu, we will have a tensor with three indices, TI, J, K. And neurons, they don't interact in triplets. They tend to interact uh, in pairs, right? So this is complete nonsense from the neurobiological point of view. And it turns out that that's not quite correct. Uh, and indeed, there is a very, very natural way uh, of thinking about these neural networks as effective theories. So it turns out that these many body interactions between the neurons, they only arise if you write down a perfectly two body uh, theory with two body interactions. And then you take the auxiliary neurons and you integrate them out. So you exclude them on the dynamical equations. And then if you do them, you get these many body terms. But it is possible to design a network that has perfectly two-body uh, you know, structure. And uh, we, we have actually written a whole paper about that. Uh, like this paper uh, from IQR 2021 is dedicated to this question. Uh, so please take a look at it. So the roughly speaking, the idea is that you need to design an architecture that is a little bit like a restricted Boltzmann machine. So you need to have a layer of hidden neurons that are coupled to the uh, feature neurons. And then uh, like those couplings, uh, they are perfectly two body. But once you integrate out the hidden neurons, you get the many body interactions in, among the feature neurons. So that's, uh, so that's kind of you know, one way to answer your question. And the answer is no, there is no price. Like the network can still be uh, perfectly interpreted from the neurobiological perspective. Then there is another development that I personally find extremely uh, exciting as well. Uh, you know, like recently people observed, th there has been a lot of progress in the imaging technology related to astrocytes in neurobiology. So astrocytes are uh, these cell types uh, that are not neurons, but also like extremely abundant in the brain. In fact, uh, you know, in most of the brains, there are more astrocytes than neurons. And what astrocytes do, they uh, monitor synaptic activity. So essentially, this is a cell that kind of is connected to many, many synapses in the brain between multiple neurons. And uh, like this structure is so common that it has even uh, been given a name. It's called a tripartite synapse. And uh, the idea that I personally find extremely appealing is that uh, you can actually think about these many body synapses as astrocytes uh, being integrated out. So uh, like this is a little bit more speculative uh, hypothesis. And uh, you know, I have like uh, 
a good collaborator from MIT, Leo Kozachkov, and I saw him on this uh, call earlier today. I don't know if he's still here, but but essentially, like uh, we are uh, thinking about this interpretation as well. So it might uh, easily happen in the future that we might be able to claim that. Uh, like this many body interactions actually arise as a result of integration out of these astrocytes. But this is sort of more, uh, you know, up in the air. So I don't know if I answered your question or... Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can discuss more. I, I mean, I realize that it's kind of very closely aligned to some of the stuff that you are interested in. So I would love to talk more about this. More questions? I have a uh, question. So uh, the uh, original Hopfield network and the modern Hopfield network, again, you, you you run the dynamics to a fixed point and the fixed points are memories. And then there's a uh, you know, theoretical way of uh, calculating the number of uh, possible, you know, the average number of possible distinct memories. Can, is it, now, is it the same statement for your energy transformer that you, you run that to uh, completion and it reaches a fixed point, and there's some number of, uh, you know, there's, there's some number of, uh, you know, fixed points, or did it not? Did the fixed points come in uh, manifolds, or uh, how, how, what? What is the story yes. there? Uh, great question, Michael. And I have no idea. Uh, I mean, uh, indeed, like we designed it, uh, having in mind this picture, that indeed because we. Uh, use the dense associative memory uh, for this kind of, you know, energy-based attention that it will have distinct memories. But strictly speaking, this has never been theoretically proven or quantified in any way. I would love to have some kind of theory behind that. So the intuition is, yes, that it has like distinct memories, but maybe indeed, maybe there are manifolds. Maybe well, empirically, you, you say you, you put in different images that it wasn't trained on and it would uh, do interesting things such as, yeah. uh, you know, fill in and clean up the images. So that doesn't sound like that could be described by, if, if it were discrete memories, it would be a vast number of, of, of discrete memories, right? And not quite. Here's how I think about this. I think about uh, individual memories uh, as rules, like, you know, like this kind of rules of images that I have just, uh, mentioned earlier, right? So if there is a left portion of the face, there is a right portion of the face, and then next to each other. If there is a straight line uh, that goes through the space, the straight line tends to continue in space. There is a bunch well, of- Those are manifolds. Those are, those. That, that, that makes sense, but those are, are, are not points in the space of images. Those are like manifolds in the space of images. Maybe, I don't know. I don't want to kind of, you know, to- uh, uh, to make strong okay, points. So inter interesting, interesting question, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It, it, is, it is indeed a very interesting question. But but I yeah. still kind of, you know, I somehow like when we designed them, we had this idea of uh, distinct memories. And maybe this idea is wrong. Uh, but 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 I kind of, you know, I, I just maybe I explained it in, in uh, not the optimal way. I want to kind of, you know, reiterate this explanation, this picture that may be wrong that I have in my mind. So I think about each memory in the energy transformer as a specific rule. Again, like uh, if I have if I have a straight line that goes up, I know that uh, token number one needs to be followed by token number two, and token number two needs to continue that line, right? Well, that, so, you know, yeah, again, that, that I, I think that's a reasonable intuition, and I'm telling you that that corresponds to submanifolds of the space of images. It's very clear in your example of take the uh, left half of the image and reflect it to the right half of the image. There's a set of uh, equalities between pixel values, so you've cut it down to if there were n pixels, you cut it down to a manifold of dimension n over two. Yes, yes, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. So I think what what I think we are kind of you know saying the same thing. But what I'm saying is that in the latent space, I think about them as distinct uh, like local basins of attraction. But maybe indeed, once you pass through like all the uh, sort of nonlinearities that you need to do in order to go from the uh, latent space into the image plane, it becomes more like a continuous manifold. Or maybe it is a continuous manifold in the latent space as well. I would love to get some kind of, you know, clarity on that. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I don't know how to analyze uh, those networks theoretically. I mean, it's like much more uh, complicated task than, uh, you know, like simple networks that we have analyzed uh, theoretically uh, before. Uh, but indeed, like it's an open question. 
So we kind of we do have some intuition, maybe not quite correct intuition. We do see that it kind of works empirically, but I, I'm kind of you know confident that there is no rigorous theory yet, and it would be really like nice to kind of to get some clarity on that. Right. Yeah, um, that's all questions. Where we are. Uh, okay. Well, if, if there are no further questions from the audience, let's, let's thank uh, Dima for a very uh, inspiring and enlightening talk. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Michael. Sure. So this will be the uh, last of our uh, new technology seminars of the uh, semester. Uh, everybody uh, have a, a great summer, and uh, we'll start again in uh, September, and I'll send out uh, messages as the schedule gets set. So uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming. I will stop the recording.